Ja, auch von meiner Seite einen schönen guten Abend. Ich freue mich, dass wir jetzt, nachdem wir viel über die Vergangenheit und die Probleme gehört haben, hoffentlich die Gelegenheit haben, hier ein bisschen über die Zukunft zu sprechen und was die Herausforderungen 20 Jahre nach Rio sind. Wie ja schon mehrfach erwähnt worden ist, ist eine, eins der großen Themen, die es bei der Rio Plus 20 Konferenz geben soll, das Thema Green Economy eine Antwort, die die Vereinten Nationen auf diese multiplen Krisen geben. Auch andere Akteure präsentieren ja ähnliche Modelle mit ähnlich klingenden Namen. Die Grünen ihren Green New Deal, die OECD ihr Konzept von Green Growth und so weiter. Wir wollen heute Abend diskutieren, was sich dahinter verbirgt, ob diese Konzepte wirklich die richtigen Antworten auf die Krise geben oder ob es sich nur, wie der Titel der Veranstaltung sagt, um alten Wein in neuen grün gestrichenen Schläuchen handelt. Wie Chris bereits gesagt hat, haben wir hier ein sehr interessantes Podium. Wer heute Abend hier mit uns diskutieren wird, ist zum einen zu meiner Rechten Achim Steiner. Er ist Exekutivdirektor des UN-Umweltprogramms als Nachfolger von Klaus Töpfer, der das ja vor ihm gemacht hat. Er ist geboren in Brasilien, aufgewachsen, studiert in London, in vielen verschiedenen Ländern gelebt, jetzt eben in Nairobi. Er ist politischer Ökonom und ein wichtiger Vertreter und Mitentwickler des Konzepts der Green Economy der Vereinten Nationen. Herzlich willkommen. Applaus Zu meiner Linken sitzt jemand, der jetzt nicht im Programm für dieses Panel angekündigt war. Das liegt daran, dass Sunita Narein, die hier angekündigt war, erkrankt ist und deswegen ihre Reise nach Berlin absagen musste. Aber ich würde sagen, wir haben hervorragenden Ersatz mit Camila Moreno, die ähm, aus Brasilien stammt, dort Koordinatorin der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung ist für den Bereich Nachhaltigkeit und ähm, als Teilnehmerin an vielen UN-Konferenzen den Prozess der letzten Jahre verfolgt hat, auch beteiligt ist an den Vorbereitungen zum Gegengipfel zum Rio Plus 20 Treffen, dem sogenannten People's Summit und sich davor lange Zeit in der Umweltbewegung engagiert hat, unter anderem bei Friends of the Earth für den, zu den Bereichen Landwirtschaft, Gentechnik und Klima. Herzlich willkommen, Camilla. Und der dritte Diskutant hier auf dem Podium ist äh, Tim Jackson. Tim Jackson ist Professor an der Universität Surrey in England. Er ist hat ursprünglich Mathematik studiert, ist jetzt Professor für nachhaltige Ökonomie, war Regierungsberater von Tony Blair und Gordon Brown über Fragen von Klimawandel und äh, äh, Wirtschaftsfragen. Und in Deutschland ist er vor allem bekannt durch sein Buch Wohlstand ohne Wachstum, in dem es auch dem grünen Wachstum, über das ja viel geredet wird, eine Absage erteilt und für eine Ökonomie vollständig ohne Wachstum plädiert. Weil dieses Podium, auf diesem Podium zwei Teilnehmer ohnehin nur Englisch sprechen könnten zu Ihnen und einer genauso gut Englisch wie Deutsch spricht, haben wir entschieden, weil die Diskussion auf dem Podium immer leichter ist, wenn man da nicht auch noch hin und her übersetzen muss, dass wir die Diskussion insgesamt auf Englisch machen. Ich hoffe, dass das für alle okay ist, aber wie gesagt, Übersetzung hätte man ja für zwei Drittel ohnehin gebraucht. Mit diesen Vorreden würde ich dann auch einsteigen und deswegen zu Englisch switchen. And, um, and I would ask to, um, I would ask Achim Steiner to uh, start our podium, maybe with a short uh, presentation of the ideas of the green economy that the United Nations Environmental Program has developed. And if you can also tell us whether you think, what you think of the criticism that this is just old wine in new green houses, as the title of our panel suggests. What is your suggestion, what Rio should decide? So, I switch with you. Guten Abend, alle miteinander hier. Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me begin by saying that I feel it's a really uphill struggle that I have been given tonight. I have just listened to an hour of a critique on many aspects and I was asked by Malte to present in five minutes three years of work, 600 pages of analysis about what the green economy is. Slightly unfair. So let me try another tack. And I do this out of the deepest respect for my two 
um, speakers who are true leaders of our community, Nemo Basse and Barbara Unmüsig. But let me say to you, I just listened to something that I would consider a sermon to your faithful. And I listened to an hour of critique about everything that you do not want to have on this planet. And quite frankly, a lot of it I share completely. But you did not offer one answer on how on earth are we going to deal with food on our planet with 9 billion people? How on earth are we going to address the fact in just eight years from now, one third of the world's population is going to live in water-stressed countries? You did not offer one answer to how you will move our global juggernaut of an economy to actually reduce its emissions in the next 38 years by 80% in the industrialized world if you're even going to come close to the IPCC. You have not answered in one example how on earth are we going to liberate the world's farmers from an economy that is forcing them to be miners of the soil rather than custodians of our ecosystems. Now, what I have three, four minutes to do this evening is a, in a sense, reflection of a lifelong journey in which I do not want to be part of a movement anymore that every time that when we debate the difficult discussions in our society, the environmental community speaks with one voice on the one hand, or actually with many voices, but with, in a sense, at best the science, at best the imperative, at best the rights discourse, but then take any cabinet meeting of a government, take any discussion show on television, the next speaker comes along and says, oh yes, but you can't answer how we will provide jobs, how we will feed ourselves, how our economy will develop. You're just telling us what not to do. So the first thing I want to appeal to you tonight is I will not have the chance to tell you what is in this Green Economy Report by any stretch of the imagination. But let me say two things. First of all, do not believe what everybody might think is in it. Because most people do not seem to read it carefully, at least, I would say. Secondly, please do take some time and look into it, because it is, apart from being a title, actually a compendium of people from across the world who have experimented with precisely the questions that I just mentioned. Now, let's for a moment look at this term green economy. <clears throat> First of all, it is not a new ideology. It is not an alternative nirvana. It is actually, in the first instance, an attempt to bring economics economics as a discipline to the issue of environment. Because the conversation of the last 40 years, quite frankly, to me, in large part, explains why we are meeting in 2012, and Nemo Basse's and Barbara Unmusik's balance sheet of the world is what it is. And everybody points at everybody else. This is also a failure of our work as a community. And if you accept that, then perhaps we can begin to ask ourselves, how are we conducting the discourse in our societies where people need to be convinced that we can do more than critique, that we actually can answer the question of whether my child will have a chance to eat tomorrow, where I will live, whether I will still have the place where I live today, because sea level rise will drive millions of people away from where they are now. So please distinguish for a moment in economic models and ideologies and economics simply as a discipline that brings, yes, a financial and economic perspective to the issues of environment. Camilla will speak to the fact that this automatically is the same as privatizing nature. I challenge that presumption. If you try and describe the economic value of an asset, and Nemo said you cannot give nature value, well, obviously you cannot give it a value that describes its totality in terms of its meaning to us, to an indigenous community, in terms of the relationship to the spirits. But what you can do is, is to look at what happens when a society, yes, does decide with economics as its principal transaction tool today, when nature has no value. In our economic system today, that is a tragedy. And it explains why society gets away why society gets away with destroying nature day after day because it basically does not register as a loss to our society. And please, we cannot ask every citizen in our community to understand the intricacies of ecology, biology, climate science in order to second guess what happens. So, that's one. Two more things if I may put them forward. The Green Economy Report is also, as I said, not an alternative nirvana in describing one singular outcome. It is actually an attempt 
to begin where we are today, in a crisis, in multiple crises, in societies that are confused, that are being undermined in many of their fundamental, in a sense, certainties of the 20th century, and where we have to find a discourse in our society that doesn't just articulate what we don't want, it actually begins to take people on a journey of how we can make the transition. So I defend the Green Economy Report for what it does, which is to begin to pick up people from where they are today with unemployment, climate change, financial crisis, indebtedness, and starts to give them a perspective of how to get out of this GDP singular view. Final point, we will talk in a moment a lot about growth. I do not believe that the term growth, as it has become, in a sense, the symbol of a misguided society, by using an extremely crude indicator, as Nemo Basse said, that simply measures something that moves from A to B, that that, however, is the core problem of our world. I think in what Tim will also speak to, there are many drivers. But please let us also be honest. Growth in itself has to be defined in qualitative terms. At the moment, it is simply a quantitative indicator and it has become an enslavement of our public pol policy discourse. But qualitative discussions about growth, I think, are valid. And please, do not forget, we do have, in some parts of the world, still a lot of people who will not have any light when they go to bed. In Africa, it is 80% of close to a billion people. Somewhere we will have to produce more of some things. But I think we will discuss in the course of this evening, what does it mean to decouple? How far can you do relative and absolute decoupling? And I would simply say to you that I am not somebody who would say technology is everything, and nor is the Green Economy Report of UNEP only about technology. But colleagues, we sit in a hall today that in less than 20 years, is able to produce the same amount of light that we need in this room here with one-tenth of the electricity. So please don't tell me that technology is not a key part of the equation on how on earth we are going to survive in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure you will have more time later. It's not that you should speak only five minutes, that, but we do, after two long lectures, we wanted to start with shorter statements. That's all I meant. Um, uh, Camilla Morena, um, Achim Steiner already said, you're a strong critique of the, of the concept of the green economy. You're organizing a meeting against the Rio, Rio Plus 20 meeting, and you call the whole concept of a green economy, a wolf in sheep's, in sheep's clothes. Um, what is your main objection against this idea? Where does it def differ from what you want? Why do you think it's not going the right direction at least? Do you really think Achim Steiner is such a bad wolf? Uh, first, one, clari one clarification. Indeed, uh, Ahim, it's not a wolf. And I have to acknowledge that uh, you gave a very great speech at the opening of the Nagoya, uh, the COP, the Biodiversity COP in Nagoya. I was there and I listened, so please. Um, although there are different shades of green uh, that Barbara already mentioned, uh, including the UNEP report that defines green economy as low carbon resource efficiency and socially inclu so efficient and socially inclusive, there are the other versions from OECD, McKinsey and the Biomasters, and they are not unison at the same, they have important differences. Even UNEP cannot break uh, with the engine of growth as the central of what moves our economy. So, uh, letting me share a little of, of how we from the South, how are we feeling and how are we seeing the process. We are very worried that, especially since the financial crisis of 2008, Green economy has served as a magic motto to galvanize a discourse around a supposed, a supposed concerted effort to solve the crisis. And we are very worried because we are the ones that suffer more directly how this hegemony is built. It's important, especially because it's a, um, 
majorly young audience that the discourse of President Truman in 1948 launched the word development as the synthesis, as the end goal of how the society should strive for. And this was the code for the expansion of capitalism and the expansion of US hegemony. When this word was empty of meaning in 18, uh, 1987, the, uh, the Brundtland report uh, came out with the proposition of the sustainability. And thus, sust sustainable development was celebrated in Rio 19, 19, 1992, sorry, with the numbers is quite difficult, which was a meeting that also served to celebrate the end of the Cold War three years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So now we are very worried that the f after the whole financial crisis, we see as a key demand of the financial systems to lend, to ballast, to use as the ballast what they call natural capital. And that's the core center of how social movements in the South are, have launched and are going to move forward a global campaign against green economy. Uh, I'm very sorry, uh, Ahim, but uh, this, is, this is, is, is something that uh, it's on the table. It's, the key, it's a key issue for the People Summit. And why people are already rejecting something that apparently is a very nice idea, how we should value nature and incorporate this and try to uh, demystify material, material, materiality, as I think it's the name of one of UNEP report. Because natural capital comes with a new problem property regime. It's very important to know that right now in South America, all of our environmental laws are being changed and reformed to incorporate something that is top priority in the US aid agenda, that is carbon rights. Historically, the regime of pri private property has accompanied from, Europe, from, from the European to 200, 300 centuries of transforming land in private property. In the 20th century, when we have this intellectual property regime, we have the whole privatization of seeds, and now we are creating this new realm of property that needs to have a juridical back, backwardness, back, uh, backing. Backing. I mean, w right now in Brazil, and this was top story in the newspapers a month ago, where is the indigenous people signing contracts, giving away their carbon rights over their land. Is this a fiction? Well, pretty much of the capitalism, it's based on fiction. It's based on commodifying. But at the concrete terms, the people that are getting rights over these lands are giving not only carbon rights, but are having privileged access to where the most precious resources are. So I think uh, when we look what, how green economy is turning on at the ground, and I can give a lot of examples in Brazil, we cannot accept it right away as it is, because it's not recognizing a very wide struggle of social movements that do have alternatives. Of course, they are not one hegemonic alternatives. They are locally and culturally appropriate, and they suppose a very different view of society. Yeah, Tim Jackson, you are promoting, as I said, a prosperity without growth, which is the title of your book. The United Nations concept stresses that we, for at least for some time, do need growth, but it has to be green growth. Can you tell us why you think that growth is no longer acceptable at all, not even if it's green growth as promoted by the United Nations? What's the problem with growth and what's the alternative? Um. Let me, let me first say, actually, that the UNEP goes a little further than that. They claim <clears throat> something quite strong about green growth, that, that, that it's faster than brown growth. And the Towards an Economy uh, report calls on some modeling um, <coughs> to support that claim. Um, I want to come back to that later, that claim. I, I think it's mistaken. Um, but, I, but I think it's important to, to understand why it's mistaken and, and how it's mistaken. So... so let me, let me also say, I mean, it's a little bit for me like um, listening to mum and dad argue here. 
Um, <laughs> you know that sound of raised voices through closed doors? No, of course you don't. You all come from happy families. It's, it's, there's a sense here of, of sides of an argument um, having a go at each other over problems that are not, not just seem intractable, but in some cases are, are harder than anything else that we have to face. And I think that is the nature of a true dilemma. And, and I think it's, it's wrong to, to avoid the dilemma. It's wrong to suppose that we can easily find a solution to the kinds of problems that you've all come here to be interested in. And it's also wrong to accept any simple diagnosis of that di dilemma. The dilemma is profound. We should accept that growth is unsustainable, at least in the form that we've had it. But we should also recognize the position from which Achim comes, in which most of the world's economies sit, that degrowth or decroissance in the much more palatable French is deeply unstable. We do not know how to make economies work when they're not growing. And that is, a, that is a profound dilemma. Nobody here has the answer to that. That is exactly what we should be, what we should be dedicating our energy towards addressing. We shouldn't necessarily be applauding a diagnosis of the world as completely screwed. We shouldn't necessarily be applauding those who tell us that corporations are through and through bad. Neither should we be applauding those who say that capitalism needs no reform. These extreme positions are unhelpful. They don't bring us towards the heart of the dilemma. They don't bring us towards an understanding of how we ourselves are involved in the dilemma. Sehr gerne. Ich entschuldige mich gleich, dass, dass ich nicht mein Deutsch über den Abend halten werde. Aber glauben Sie mir, das wird, äh, wird das alles viel besser auf Englisch laufen. Mindestens für mich. I want to say very clearly that growth is not always bad. Growth in the incomes, in the livelihoods, in the nutrition, in the health, in the education of the poorest two billion in the world is absolutely essential. I think... <laughs> you did hear what I said about not necessarily applauding platitudes, didn't you? <laughs> um, you that, that, thank you, that, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I, I, also want, I also want to say that, that we should accept that growth has brought us in the rich world, good things. We have a better standard of health. We have better nutrition. We have good participation in education. We have interesting, fun things to play with on our iPhones. We have the ability to travel across the world. We have the ability to think about our own individual lives in a sense of freedom. And all of these things matter but not a single one of them changes the reality. The good life, as we have come to conceive it, a world in which everyone has the material standards of the Western nations, of the richest in the West, is simply unaccessible. There are not enough resources. We cannot move carbon fast enough towards the targets. We cannot find technologi technological implications fast enough. None of this is credible. And this brings me back to my critique of the UNEP report. The target is too low in the report. The, the, the two strategies are not compared on an equal basis. And the way in which the dilemma is posed doesn't give you a strong enough sense of just how difficult it is to bring nine billion people to the living standards of the United States of America and still keep growth. These are the circumstances. This is what we have to face. This is how we have to confront the dilemma. And in these circumstances, I think we have to ask both the question that Achim Steiner is asking and the question that Camilla is, um, is attempting to ask. Is this system capable of delivering a good life for nine billion people? Nine. Das glaube ich auch. It is a system actually which is structurally deficient, in which we cannot move technological innovation fast enough. And one of the reasons we can't do that, to come back to something that Nimmo talked about, 
is because we have profoundly misconstrued who we are, what it means to be human beings. We've seen ourselves purely as materialistic, selfish consumers, and we've built all our institutions as though to support that notion of humanity. We have to change those institutions, we have to change that economic structure. That is a more profound task than anything that has been talked about so far in the terminology of green growth. But I'm sure we'll get further with it this evening. Thank you very much. Um, Um, Achim Steiner, what do you say to those criticisms? Do they have a point? Is it a real danger that corporations are taking over the United Nations, as Camilla has said? And do you... <laughs> Sorry? Oh. Okay. Um, and do you, do you also see the point of uh, Tim Jackson that uh, the changes within the system don't seem to be able to work out a solution for nine billion people? or? Do you believe that they don't that they miss your point? Yeah. You know, in large part, I can sign up to a lot of what both of them have said. In fact, out of a tradition of analysis, I would share a lot of the, let's say, um, frameworks with which we have to address those issues, whether it is about the issues of tenure, of land rights, of the alienation of people from their resources. Just like Tim, yes, in our economic system, not only at the individual level, we live in an age where the relationship between nations is defined essentially as one of competition. And I thought we had progressed, you know, as civilization and as humanity beyond it. So I, I don't have any problems with that. My question is, how do you begin to achieve a transition from where we are today, which is caught in a paradigm, you call it an iron cage, into a world in which we can live together as nine billion people. And the answer cannot be, well, sorry, there's no more room for the rest of you. Can you please figure out how else to live? Which has been a little bit the problem between the North and the South. So to me, the issue is, what have we learned about what we can change? And yes, there will always be risks and there will always be contradictions. There will be good corporations and there will be bad corporations. I think to argue that you know, we, because of the risk of land being taken away from people, we should not give an, a value to, first of all, an ecosystem that people look after and maintain, that secondly, everybody else is benefiting from. I mean, you are sitting here in Berlin, benefiting from the custodianship and the conservation efforts of the indigenous peoples of the Congo Basin, of the Amazon, from the money that the Brazilian taxpayer has invested in protecting the Amazon, even with all the contradictions, and you're not paying a penny for it. Now, how on earth is that going to help in manage an increasingly pressurized planet in which people have to survive? Now, the second thing I want to say is when you attach an economic value to something like an ecosystem service, first of all, there is a physical reality. The Amazon is the largest water pump on our planet. South America's economy depends for its life on it, as do its people. Right now in Brazil, you're having a debate about forests. And I think, you know, one can just point the finger and say, well, you know, this is retrogression and people might be going backwards. But I think we also have to ask ourselves, how is it possible after eight years of President Lula, after all that Brazil has already, in a sense, done in correcting some of the older policy positions it had, and some of the extraordinary achievements in reducing deforestation, why is a society like Brazil, at the peak of its economic development, suddenly in danger of undoing a lot of that? And I think the answer is more complex. And growth is a part of the problem, but I would not limit it to that. And I think we need to ask ourselves, where are there solutions? And, you know, I sit in the United Nations today. We have 190 nations. And in fact, there isn't one world, as we all know. There are 190 million or even 7 billion realities. We have to accommodate many different pathways. And there will be the state-led, the market-led, the small countries, the large countries, the technology-led ones. We have to find a way in which we can bring 
let's say, a perspective to the future of how we develop as a global society and with economy as a very central part of defining that relationship in a different way. And I think there we are all in agreement. I now look at where are the low-hanging fruits, where are the opportunities. In a country like Kenya, where three quarters, actually 80% of its population does not have access to electricity, the country had a choice. It could either build coal-fired power stations, I mean, they're even discussing nuclear power stations in Kenya as an option, or it could go down a renewable energy path. Now, people say, oh, technology and technology isn't all the solution. There's a billion Africans who, over the next 20 to 30 years, are either going to go for a fossil fuel-based energy pathway on that continent, or they're going to go into a renewable energy pathway. Kenya right now is going to double its electricity generating infrastructure in the next five years, and you know how they're going to do it? Without adding one gram of CO2 emissions to our atmosphere. Because they passed the green energy law three years ago. They were bold and they said, we will develop a different pathway with geothermal power, with wind power, and with photovoltaic. So, you know, these are not just abstract discussions. They are real life discussions that are happening right now. And we can say, oh, the green economy will take us in the wrong direction. We are on the wrong pathway. Can we, through the green economy, begin to identify things that, rather than divide us more, chart a way in which we can converge into a different pathway with many, many different realities? And believe you me, no country on this planet and no political leader has the right to say they have gotten it all right. I mean, this is a fact. And we, in each of our societies, are struggling with these topics. Um, yeah, Camilla, he was addressing your point that um, I think it's a question that I would like to ask you is whether you see his point that uh, giving a value to natural resources, which you said may be a big problem for the, for the people who use the land now, he says it can be a big chance for the people who use the land now because by giving it a value they might be able to protect it better. What's your, what's your answer to this question? Well, it's not my answer, it's the answer from a, a broad coalition of uh, civil society organizations which we work with, is that uh, we are for the commons. So we cannot accept that in the name of, for the sake of the end goal, we accept that right now we are going to define a new property regime to give to property landowners the right to explore and to receive payments, for example, for pollination services. Pollination services are ranked very top high on what should be this uh, invisible services that should be accounted for. But who is going to receive for the bees, for the bats? Are they unionized? Who is going to receive the payments? We also have payments for scenic beauty. Who defines what is scenic beauty? And what is the beauty that is not scenic? But what worries us the most is that one very important ecosystem services, which is the provision of topsoil, the, the, the group that is receiving now payments for environmental service for this is agribusiness in Brazil for the kindness of doing no-till agriculture. So recalling what Ahim said, that during Lula's government we achieved um, uh, uh, important advances, I think we disagree on this, because under Lula's government and under the very powerful Brazilian agribusiness that opened a lot of markets for the Brazilian products and for the companies, uh, go the government has to, to make very strong concessions. For example, approving GMOs. With our right-wing president, we, could not, uh, we did not see the GMOs approve it. And that was done in the first year of Lula's government. Not only soy, cotton, corn, feijão, which is beans. Now we have sugarcane, eucalyptus, and orange trees, all GMOs. And now we are going to one step further. We are, we are testing on Brazil synthetic biology to produce synthet synthetic diesel. And this frame it under green technology and uh, under renewable energy. So I think uh, we cannot, and I think this is one flaw of the UNEP report, we cannot think of the resources disembodied as if disembodied from the social relations of power. And in this case, it's not economics that is going to address anything. It's truly going back to 
pol politics in the old and good old sense and to take political decisions that cannot be hostage of this economic rationality and economic thinking. Because it's not even economics in the very good old sense of housekeeping, but is this economics completely abstracted from real life that was captured by the financial and the financialization and all the, this market that has brought us to 2008 crisis. Um, uh, in his opening remarks, Achim said that um, what you say s m may sound right, but he doesn't really see a way how you will get there, that we need a first step to take to, to change things and that we have to work with the structures that we have at the moment and move on from then. From, uh, what's your idea on how to how to get to this point that you're talking about where politics takes it back and companies don't have a say anymore. What should be the first step? Land reform, number one, I always stop the, ag the agenda. Brazil is the highest concentrated land uh, ownership in the world. And we are proud of it, our, of course, not me. <laughs> uh, I think second thing is stop talking about alleviating poverty. Our problem is not poverty, our problem is richness. So we should alleviate <laughs> richness. It's a reversal. Just, and I think one very easy uh, or very simple program would be a radical redistribution of the wealth that has been socially and historically created. We have had this whole construction of the concept of ecological debt, so I think this has, been being, has to, has to be, be brought back to the table, that we did not forget the whole colonial history that made modernity possible. And so we should stop using this, this, this developed. When I was growing up, I learned that there are people developed, some are developing, this is, was our case, and some were subdeveloped. And I was seven, eight years old, very happy that I, at least I was developing. And this is a mental, this is a mental prison. We need to get out of this epistemic way of thinking. for new utopias, and the utopia is not in the economics, the utopia is on the ground, the utopia is on concrete level, it's a community level and it's a regional level. So just to end, I think one old agenda that has been forgotten is deglobalized trade. And this is very important also. Um. Mr. Jackson, what uh, Camilla is asking for is that the northern countries have to pay back their historical debt, which would mean we have to shrink, not to grow. Now, you've been working as a government advisor, and um, at least in Germany, there's quite a f we have six parties, uh, some of which are in favor of green growth, some are in favor of brown growth, some are in favor of less growth, there's none that is in favor of shrinking, and I believe it might be hard to win it um, it might be hard to win a democratic election by telling people you all have, will have less in the future, you'll have to give things away. So when you were an advisor of uh, Tony Blair and uh, Gordon Brown, what did you tell them how to convince their people that they have to shrink? Yeah, you can imagine, can't you, the, um, the politics of that situation. Um, the report was launched in the week in April 2009 in which Gordon Brown had called the leaders of the G20 to London to talk about kick-starting growth. And uh, my report was called Prosperity Without Growth. And uh, <laughs> I, I received a phone call, actually I received a phone call on the Friday evening of, 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 um, of, the launch, of that launch weekend in which I was confronted with a very um, an unnamed official, um, very irate, from an unnamed department. Um, <laughs> Who, could who you name him now? You me. aren't an advisor <laughs> anymore. <laughs> They're no longer there. It's true. I could, I could, I could forego it. But, but, uh, but, uh, but they informed me that um, that number ten in an unnamed street in London <laughs> <laughs> had gone ballistic, 
And, and, and you can see why, because, because everybody wanted growth back. Everybody wanted growth back. It is the politics of the richest nations. Actually, one of my closest friends at that time, although he didn't know it because he, we hadn't met each other, was, was a guy called Achim Steiner, um, because he had talked about the distribution of investment. He talked about redirecting our economies. He had a concept called the green economy, and at that time, nobody had had the chance to undermine it and to denounce it as a hegemony of the West. It was at that time just two words put together, which actually spoke a great deal, not just about the crisis, but, but about possibility, about restructuring our economies, about doing something better. And in many ways, that's what we tried to say to the government of the UK as well. And, and it, it was, in terms of its initial aims, I would say a profound failure. It fell on stony ground, and within a year the commission no longer existed. So it, it, may be, um, it may be an advantage to be an advisor to governments, or it may just be a recipe to find yourself uh, out, of, out of a place as, a, as an advisor. My point is, and my point in the report was, and my, rep my point today is, and it remains the same, I think, it is the responsibility of the richest nations to find a different way of development. A different way of development for the poorest countries in the world, a different way of development for the industrializing, fast industrializing countries of the world, maybe, but absolutely, definitely, a different way of development for the richest nations in the world. Because we cannot sustain a growth-based model in societies which are already so materially profligate, in which consume vast proportions of the Earth's resources and manipulates the environment, the atmosphere, the water, the biosphere, and biodiversity in ways which are already beyond what we can handle. We have to think of a different model. It is clear where growth is needed. Growth is needed in the poorest countries, and the richest must make room for growth where growth is most needed. It is our responsibility in the West to change our own economic system. It's not our responsibility to tell the poorest what to do in changing theirs. But but what do you answer to the people here, for example, in Europe that tell you without growth we'll have unemployment, people will lose jobs, we won't have enough money in the social system anymore to keep up the public welfare, and so on. In our system, everything is coupled to growth, and without growth, as long as we have the system we have, we run into trouble economically. And as soon as people start losing their jobs in big numbers, they'll say, I don't care about big schemes, I want a job, I want food, I want schooling for my kids. So how do you think this change can happen first in the heads, but also in reality that we get to a path of no growth without big economic problems that affect everybody? Poverty is, poverty is much of a problem in, in, in Europe um, as it is anywhere else. Not, it isn't so extreme as it is in other parts of the world, but it is a structural problem in the same way, and it has to be taken seriously. And so is unemployment, so is joblessness. We should be absolutely clear that jobs matter. Now, I started out talking about how profound this dilemma is. I think the change in hearts is simply to recognize the dilemma, not to believe that we can simply keep the system going, getting back to business as usual, getting back to the growth past. These, these are illusions in the current context, and they're illusions partly for the reasons that I've mentioned, that we can't make the technology work fast enough, partly because the horrible social injustices that are still rife across the world, and partly because the system itself in 2008, 2009, drove itself to the point of near collapse, took us to the edge of catastrophe. And it did that by creating a financial system deliberately designed to promote more and more growth, built around unsustainable debts to household, unsustainable debts in government, and unsustainable debts to the ecology, that is simply disastrous. So the financial system is a place where we absolutely have to start. We have to ask the toughest questions about the financial system. We have to... <laughs> we have to do that, I think, with an eye to the toughest 
questions of all, which is what is our own implication in that? Our pensions rely on it, our social security relies on it. To some extent, our employment relies on it. So it isn't a question simply of demolishing structures and hoping that something will emerge from the grassroots where everybody is happy and loves each other and community is the big society. We have this terminology in our country, the big society uh, takes over from all our concerns. This will not happen. It's not happening in Greece, it's not happening in Portugal, it's not happening in Spain. In these countries, exactly what you're suggesting is the real danger of economies that don't grow. So we have to actually go back to basics. We have to ask what matters to us here. What matters is employment, meaningful work. What matters is nutrition. What matters is health. What matters is education. Actually, economies built around the production, the endless production of material stuff for the sake of a conversation between ourselves that was never about material stuff is broken. This is an economic concept that is broken. So when you ask me what are the basic things that we need to do, we need to reform our financial structures. We need to build a sense of investment that is meaningful in terms of the long term. And here is absolutely where Achim played into a very important dialogue. Investing in renewable technologies, in clean technologies, is a very different thing than investing in production facilities to build goods for people who cannot afford to buy them and build up unsustainable debts in the process. This is a, a task which is about the re negotiation of economics itself. We desperately need an economics in which stability no longer depends upon economic growth. And in those circumstances, these things are possible. It is possible, in fact, to move your economies towards a more service-based economy, which is labor-intensive, which employs real people. It has less impact on the environment, and it delivers the things that give us the capabilities to live well. And yet, it is denigrated in the existing system. If you want to know how to employ people, stop thinking about the unregulation of the financial sector. Stop thinking about the meaningless production of cars which nobody will be able to afford to drive in a few years' time and think about the production of services, of health, of education, of social care, of recreation, of leisure the renovation of buildings, the building of public space, the creation of museums and libraries, the sense of ourselves sharing a common space for a common good. This is how to build our economies. And it isn't a pipe dream, it isn't utopia, it isn't tearing everything down, it's having a positive vision and beginning to build it. Um, Mr. Steiner, you've been nodding to what's been said, but at some points I think there's a difference because uh, your United Nations program relies a lot on growth. If you look at those 10 points, there's many of new investments in new sectors and as I understand it, one of the ideas is that this growth will be decoupled from natural depletion. But um, many people ask the question whether that's possible, whether that's just not postponing it a little bit. Is it really possible to decouple this growth from the, from the use of resources in the way that you, that you present it? Well, I think the, the record that we have had so far of decoupling is certainly in an absolute sense um, very untested. In a relative sense, we actually have decoupled already for the last 50 or 60 years, our GDP growth traditionally measured from resource consumption in the global economy. There is wonderful work, and again, I would urge you, for those of you who are interested, one of Germany's greatest minds, Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker, together with Asher Kostler, head an international resources panel, where they are studying this whole question of what are we actually consuming on our planet? Because we, we discuss it in global terms, but we need to begin to understand in, in very specific terms what is happening. I personally believe that we have two issues at hand. One is, what is the political economy and social model that a society wants to pursue? And, you know, I don't want to be on, on a different side of what Camilla is arguing is, in a sense, an injustice or is a problem. Now, your conclusion is that you want to essentially 
you know, take property out of the hands of individuals or, you know, favor the commons. But that's the next step. I mean, I want to establish the principles of a green economy viability irrespective of the social model. Now, you know, some of you will say, how naive? Well, I'm sorry. You can look across the world today. You have Bolivia, you have Venezuela. Would you argue that because of the rhetoric of the social project there, there are not contradictions? You have China, a state-led economy, and you have a society such as ours here in Germany, which out of its free volition has just taken a step that it would not have dreamt of having the courage to do in the energy policy even five years ago. So when you look at the history of environment and environmental sustainability and environmental justice, the contradictions and the sins that have been committed have been committed under any kind of political ideology that has been articulated. So I want to leave the choice to the community, to the nation, through hopefully a democratic process, to choose whether they wish to go down a state-led economy or a market-led economy or an economy where the commons are the defining principle. But under either system, you know that the term, the tragedy of the commons, does not exist for nothing. The commons in itself does not guarantee environmental sustainability. It is the governance, the accountability, the structures, the involvement of, of everyone in governing such an asset that will ultimately determine what happens. But to come back to your point, we have today enough lessons from across the world that we know that if we continue to subsidize fossil fuels to the tune of $600 billion in our global economy, then forget about trying to help people wean themselves off and move over to renewable energy. So what is the subsidy policy that derives from that? Secondly, ecological tax reform and policy. What are we actually rewarding people or punishing people to do? What is the, you know, in German we have this term Ordnungspolitik and the polarity between the state and the market is something that in our society we debate a lot. Now, Barbara Unmüssig talked about policy frameworks in her introductions. If I were to summarize to you what is the Green Economy Report about, it is to give expression to the popular will about a different future through the democratic process by which we set the policies that govern the marketplace and not the other way around. But that requires us to have more than a critique. We then have to explain where are the jobs going to come from. And I would love in Germany for somebody to actually do the calculation because I constantly hear, oh, this, you know, Energieeinspeisungsgesetz, I mean, a wonderful German word, uh, <laughs> green tariff, is costing us so much. We should actually be asking, perhaps in terms of what also Tim spoke about, if we talk about the cost of a kilowatt hour of electricity, in future, we don't only talk about the cheapest kilowatt hour, but we also factor into it which one generates the most jobs per kilowatt hour that we buy and produce in our society. Because then we begin to recalibrate the way we discuss energy pathways in our society. And UNEP's report, and I don't have time this evening because there is a wealth of data in there, shows, and nobody has contested that model, that if we were to move by the year 2030 worldwide to a 30% renewable energy mix, we would actually create 30% more jobs than there are business as usual scenario. And quite frankly, I have more faith in winning the debate against those who want to essentially destroy our planet by being able to go out there and say to 40 or 50% of young Spaniards, we can give you far more jobs with this economic pathway than if you follow the model of yesterday. Now, is that all about growth or anti-growth? There are contradictions in there. They will not all be resolved. But I would say, yes, we can decouple. I think you ain't seen nothing yet of what we can do because decoupling has never been given a chance. When fuel costs nothing, how will you actually bring decoupling into the economy? When the cost of destroying entire ecosystems is zero to the economy, how on earth are you going to bring about decoupling? And that has as much to do with the economic signals and instruments as it has to do with the social models that we choose and the political economy. But the political economy of land in Brazil is not the same as the political economy of land in the UK or in Nepal or in Australia. And that's why, again, I would plead the green economy is a set of principles to begin a transition. It is not a singular recipe for every society for the debates that we must have in halls like this. Thank you.
Ähm, mal eine kurze technische Frage jetzt. Wir sind jetzt schon fast bei dem Zeitpunkt, der ursprünglich angegeben war. Wir haben ja mit deutlicher Verspätung angefangen. Ich nehme mal an, dass, äh, also ich finde die Debatte so spannend, dass ich gerne noch ein äh, bisschen weitermachen würde, wie geplant vom, vom Zeitablauf her. Und nehme das mal als Hinweis, dass wir das auch tun sollen. Gut. I just asked them, uh, since it's nine o'clock now, which was officially the point when we should stop, but we started like more than half an hour late, whether it's okay if we continue for a while, and it is okay for almost everybody, I think. Um, Camilla, to what, uh, to what Achim Steiner just said, in the beginning it sounded as if you think um, the green economy goes in the wrong direction altogether. The way he explains it now, that it's, it doesn't favor of a certain system, it shows steps that can be used in any economic system. Do you think, after this discussion now, after this explanation, would you agree that it might be a step in the right direction at least, or do you still believe that it's as wrong as you said in the beginning? <laughs> well, uh, I don't believe in the neutrality of technology. I think uh, even I think Marx said in the beginning in German ideology, the book, there is no neutral technology, as I don't think there are no neutral economic principles that you can apply or ever you want. I think that the architects and the people that built this discourse that it very well fits together are the people that control the hegemonic process. I don't see all the alternative voices that we have, you know, taking part of those uh, important uh, G8 plus 5 or G20 meetings. So I'm afraid uh, because I don't think that the green economy will abandon the idea of natural capital and of value, uh, nature, nature putting a price of it, although um, I've read that Pavan Sukhdev which is a leading economist of a very important study on the subject, keeps saying that is not the same thing. I remember that I saw a banner from UNEP saying, you cannot value what you cannot measure. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the point is, we could definitely, I think in abstract terms, it's very difficult because the, the term is new and the idea is getting, uh, still is getting, it's getting flesh. But, and it's not the time here, I could go over the set of green economy policies that are being taken on in Brazil. And I can assure you that none of, of it really address the structural engines of generating uh, wealth and power. And uh, they, what surprised me the most is that they go very well with the brown economy. So for us, our maybe the strongest critique to the green economy is that it really is really taking ground, proposing a win-win scenario where actually you can move on with the brown economy and you can offset it through this change for the green. But as long as you have the money to pay your way out, you can keep buying different kinds of offset and there are different kinds of mechanisms where in some way you can combine. If this makes sense economically and if this makes sense financially even, it does not make sense ethically. And that's the point. And so if the economic has found a way to just a social justification and a discursive uh, dispositive to move on, we understand that ethically and morally we cannot take it anymore because traditional, traditional ways of living, traditional knowledge and the people's sovereignty over their territories are being right now as I speak completely devastated and dismantled even for the sake of green technology infrastructure. What is the case of big dams in Brazil to have this cheapest electricity per kilowatt hour that you said. If you take one of the big Amazon dams that are being built right now, they have 20,000 young men working at the pyramid thing, you know, the pharaonic um, reservoir. But the point is, once it's over, once it's done, there will be five engineers controlling the turbines and the engine. And that's my, my point to you, Tim, that this uh, idea of service economy and the technology, the technology is designed to be applied on resources and needs to transform the resource. And the resources are not in Europe. But, 
But if you say you, you don't believe in technology and they always use resources, wouldn't you agree that it's a big difference whether energy is produced by a solar panel, which uh, doesn't, once it's built, it's producing energy for 30 years without any resources being needed, or whether you need to burn fuel at the same time to get the same kind of energy? Isn't it really a new part of technology that really changes the way we need to think about energy and resources? Just one thing, I don't believe in patent technology and I don't believe technology that has not a social technology, that has not been designed in its open source because control technology does not fit us. And for the sun, <laughs> it's important not to forget that, uh, is the sun in Europe? I've heard that you are bringing the sun from Africa, no, the, s the Desert Tech project. So I think Not this yet. is one point. And another point is that the solar, the solar panels are very nice, but they depend on mining silicium. And then you have to look where, even for lithium, you have to see where the lithium reserves are and where the silicium mines are and who works and who controls and who prices those resources. Okay, Camilla. And just because I think it's a fascinating discussion. So we can't do solar panels or can we do solar panels if A, B, C, D and E is assured? Because my question to you is, if you're not for hydro, we're against oil and we're against fossil fuel and coal, right? And these are technologies that we all agree, I think, are environmentally complex. So we have a new frontier of technology emerging. Give me the conditions under which you would find a photovoltaic panel acceptable and I'll work with you, I promise you, for the rest of my life. <laughs> to actually make sure it happens. I think the qu there are two conditions very simple. Energy for what and energy for whom. Once this is socially... But that's not the panel. Sorry, you were no. criticizing the panel just now because it uses, uses lithium and, you know, the rare earth and so on. So tell me, what's a ecologically, politically and uh, whatever sound panel and how would you, in a sense, certify that this is a sound panel? shouldn't be owned by a company, maybe we can find another way of doing it. But I mean, somehow I have to tease you a little bit to say, where are you going to find the means by which you can switch the lights on for seven billion people, right? I mean... The point, uh, so just one clarification. I'm not saying I'm completely against solar panels or I'm completely against hydro. Although in Brazil we have one very large social movement called DEMS, um, um, dams affected people's movement because the dam, even the small one, they displace people. But I, I'm seriously, my question should, uh, and I think this should be everybody's question, is energy for what and energy for whom? Because nowadays we are not allowed to discuss energy policy. And I think every country in Brazil, energy is a matter of energy security. So the energy policy is done behind doors in a, for a, by a very closed um, group of people that they decide for the sake of the security of the nation state. And if we're talking about social technology and about a social need for electricity, yes, we need to light a, a bubble, a, a light bubble, but maybe not for working night shifts as in China or in, in Brazil or in Mexico in the Maquilas, but to have real light for the, li for, the, for the living and for the needs. We don't need to subsidize cheap energy, for example, to be able to export aluminum or to export pulp and paper and cellulose or to sell cheap soy to Europe that has water and energy that goes free in the package. So I think it's, uh, we really need to discuss where the energy is going, who defines how much energy we produce. Because in Brazil, energy supply is a condition for the growth strategy. So we need to be ready to give the cheapest energy electric energy in the world to attract companies and to be able to grow. So it's like a dog uh, running around its own tail and it's a vicious cycle and we need to break it. Um, I have one more question to Mr. Jackson, uh, which always comes up if we speak about uh, growth and getting rid of growth or getting less growth in Germany. Um, and maybe you can give us an, a good answer to how to answer these skeptics. Um, uh, Achim Steiner said that his idea of green economy works with a market-driven economy as well as with a state-driven economy or a commons economy. 
Um, but a growthless economy, many economists argue, doesn't work in a market-driven economy because a market depends on people investing capital and they invest capital because they want to get a return on that investment. So in the end, there has to be more than has been invested, else you won't get interest, else you won't get a return on your investment. So every market-driven system that works this way needs a certain amount of growth in order to keep running. There are ideas of a steady state economy that doesn't grow anymore, but uh, not very many economists believe they work easily. So you are one of the well-known professors that says they do. Can you give us in simple words why this objection that every market-driven economy needs growth isn't true? I'm not sure I ever said I believe they do. I think I said I believe they must. Um, I, I want What's to the idea of saying it must if it doesn't it, do? It doesn't, it doesn't quite do, but what it does is it poses very clearly what the task before us is. I just want to comment, before I come to that question, I want to comment on um, the argument, the, um, no, not, uh, the discussion between, between Achim and, and Camilla, because I, th I think that, that, that Camilla is right to point to the connectedness of economies, of economic structure, and of economic institutions to social and political structures. I think it's not entirely defensible to say that you can abstract economics or economic institutions from uh, those social and political institutions. But I, I also think that Camilla is wrong in arguing that you needs to or can even get away from economics. I think, I think you have to have economics at the table. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us actually in a position where you have to redefine the economics. You have to think again about the economic institutions. And this is, I think, where the green economy concept hasn't fully come to terms with, the ne with its own implications for social institutions, for economic institutions, for relations of property, for relations of power, for the relationship between the public sector and the private sector, the relationship between the state and the market. Now this is not a call to return to a state-oriented, autocratic, authoritarian fascism. It is a point in time at which we actually have to throw away those old distinctions and to sit here in Berlin is in one sense to do exactly that, to throw away the distinctions that once divided this city in ideological terms and to come to a point where we actually begin to accept that economics itself has to rebuild its institutions. And amongst the rebuilding of the institutions is the need, for example, to redefine who owns what and under what terms that ownership can be carried out. And that, I think... Thank you. I mean, that's very close to what Camilla is saying, so you don't need to clap me, really. That's, that's, um, that, that has implications, though, for how you build the structure of the investments that Akin wants. And he's right to want them. He's right to want the investments in ecology. He's right to want the investments in a sustainable energy system. And he's right to want the investment in a, in a green economy, though you may not like the term. And so the critical point is how you build those institutions. It's not, of course, a simple task. It is a task of asking what an economy looks like when it's resource constrained. And our, our economies are resource constrained. And when you ask that question, you have to ask what it means if consumer demand were to be constrained. If consumer demand is constrained, that means you can't just be producing material stuff all the time. If you can't be producing material stuff all the time, how do people work? If they're not working in factories and they are working in schools and in hospitals and in communities and in community centers and in renovating buildings and building public spaces, then how is that employment to be organized? And these are absolutely absolutely critical, but very concrete tasks that you can ask about the reorganization of work, of labor, of savings, of spending in a post-growth economy. And this is the work that is being carried out, whether UNEP likes it or not, whether Brazil likes it or not, whether the World Bank likes it or not, this work is already being carried out by those committed to those ideals. And I would give you only a, a few examples of the way that can work. Community-based finance, which accepts lower rates of return and returns its wealth to the community and to social ends, rather than big bank finance, 
financed by people who reap the returns without ever taking the risk. This community-based finance, it already exists in Triodos Bank, in the uh, Unified Field Trust in the United States, in Trividend, in Belgium, in any number of examples of small-scale initiatives to build finance in a way that supports community and allows us to be sustainable. These are the kinds of initiatives. This is like if you like at this point a social experiment, but perhaps the most crucial experiment that we could be creating, the new institutions for a new economy which accepts that it lives within ecological limits and accepts that social justice is the founding principle of human welfare. There, uh, I have a question for you, Tim. Um, I don't know how this, how do you discuss this here in Germany, but uh, for me, and coming from Brazil and Latin American social movements, uh, it's, um, it's very odd to think when you say we have to redefine economy entirely, no, and the institutions. And how do you address this task or this challenge? when the, maybe the key uh, distinctive trace of this economy we live in is the production of surplus value and the extraction of mehr wert in Germany. So this is, I mean, this, I'm very back to the basics and very back to good old Marx and chapter 24, the primitive accumulation and all that, that may sound very old and overcome for you, but for us it's very real and very up to date. So how would this new economy, uh, service-based or green, can actually transform this very distinctive trace of capitalism, which is the production of value out of the exploitation and the, 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 of other people's, other men and women's work. Accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets, says Marx, 20, Marx um, chapter 24, I think. Yes. Um, 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 there's a very interesting experiment. Has anyone, has anyone come across this in Berlin? From uh, This was unveiled at a meeting that I was here a year or so ago with a comedian. I don't know, Barbara, maybe you can remember the name of this woman, the artist, who, who is transferring Das Kapital in 120 pieces, 120 symbol pieces into the uh, Deutsche Bank, I think is the right, by, trans by also at the same time um, putting one euro cent into the bank. And because whenever you make a deposit in the bank, you're allowed to transfer some knowledge, about some, some, something about what that deposit refers to, she's putting 120 words for each deposit each day into, and so by the end of, I think it's 2020, the Deutsche Bank will have within its financial system the entire text of Marx's Das Kapital. <laughs> it's fantastic. And, and apparently it's also generating money which is being used for something, I can't remember what. What is her name? Ting La. Ting La. Okay, it's worth looking into it because it's fantastic. Um, uh, just, it's not entirely a way of just avoiding your question, um, although it is partly. <laughs> How, it's time, isn't it time to go home? Can we call the bell? I think my answer to you, Camilla, is that these institutions, the ones that I was describing to you, community-based finance is, is, um, is changing capitalism. It is changing. There's nothing wrong necessarily with generating a surplus. What is wrong is the question, the unquestioned ownership of the surplus from productive value by the interests of the, of the few. That, that, is, that is what is wrong with capitalism. The generating of a surplus in social terms, the generating of a surplus in economic terms, the generating of a surplus in ecological terms works if those benefits are distributed to the community. It doesn't work if it's possible to appropriate those surpluses to the minority. And I think you know, that's where your critique should focus. It is that critique, the capitalist criti the critique of capitalism should not be about the generation of revenues. It should be about the ownership of those revenues and the control of the means of production for those revenues. I wanted to ask a question, if we're in the business of asking questions, I wanted to ask Achim Steiner a question, actually. 
Am I allowed to do that? No, no, uh, it's great. It's That's the best the thing can happen to a moderator. Achim, you know, I, w I really liked, I liked the, the green economy. I liked what you were doing. I thought it was incredibly important during the crisis to put this agenda on the table and say, look, if you're going to invest some money because we're in a recession, invest in the good stuff. And it was a very simple message and a very important one, I think. But, in towards, an, but towards the green economy, you make a very strong claim which is that green growth is faster than brown growth. And the only possible reason for making that such a claim, it seemed to me, was a political one, that you don't upset those who already exist in the economy that we're trying to change. And I, I just wondered, I wondered what the process was for deciding on that kind of claim. I mean, this isn't being filmed, is it? It's not going to be on the web tomorrow. You're amongst friends here. So, I mean, is there a, is there a story behind this claim that green growth is, behind, is, is faster than ground, brown growth? Because it isn't borne out even by your own evidence. Well, in that last statement, I would at least put in brackets and say, let's wait and see, because so far the model has not been contested in terms of, sorry, for those of you who may not be aware of it, and one day I hope you're all as capable of quoting the Green Economy Report as you are Karl Marx's Capital in Chapter 24 and so on. But, you know, it took Karl Marx 100 years to get to that point, so I think we have some, some hope. <clears throat> but, um, you know, you are quite right. And first of all, you used the phrase earlier on that the green economy has not yet come to terms with its own institutional implications. You are quite right. I think, and this is not an excuse, but I think it's important to know, we began a three to five year work cycle just before the financial crisis began to develop an understanding of what could the principles that drive a green economy, a sustainable economy that is more socially inclusive, has lower environmental risks, is low carbon, and gives value to the services that a farmer, an indigenous community, or somebody who looks after uh, something that is of value to all of us um, is able to generate. The financial crisis literally came overnight, and yes, we did say at the time, this is insane. We are spending three to four thousand billion dollars, and we're actually investing in the old economy, rather than investing in the transition to new. And it was a highly successful intervention, and I cannot this evening give you the detail the Congo, some of this is not public knowledge. This intervention has actually, at that moment, triggered hundreds of billions of dollars going into another direction. But that is, you know, that's serendipity, you could almost say, in terms of the moment. What I think we wanted to do with the Green Economy Report was to create, and that's why I sometimes feel a bit sorry that it is out of the social movements and out of the environmental community, there is this sort of almost um, innate disbelief that there could be something here that can bring us together around the table was to create a concept for a world because we are the United Nations and our objective is to not look for the differences amongst nations but for the things that can actually bring us together in our differences and diversity. So the green economy concept, yes, first of all wanted to say if you come along and say, you know, we are the only ones so far who know how to do, you know, development and growth as the indicator, well, we can beat you at your own game. So, you know, don't try that one, because if it's only throughput economy that you want with GDP, sorry, we can beat you at your own game of GDP fixated growth. Semicolon. Secondly, if you actually want to go further and address the issue of unemployment and livelihoods and poverty eradication, then we can also demonstrate with the evidence of people who have done it in the real world, because the Green Economy Report is not some theoretical abstract a la Das Kapital, it is actually a compilation of evidence from all... No, I mean, he deserves to be at the table today, Karl Marx, absolutely. <laughs> but alongside a green economy report, right? <laughs> it, is full, it is full of examples of people who have tried to do these things in the real world. And that is the second message. And thirdly, what we actually argue in the report, and in all honesty, Tim, you have to also acknowledge that, we actually say to continue to argue about the welfare of our society in terms of current GDP is insane. It is completely anachronistic. It was born out of another age. It is, has no relation to, to planetary boundaries. And it is simply no way in which we can work together into the future. Final point. I don't want to sit up here and leave this podium and look like I don't know what the political economy of our societies are. I am a political scientist by training and an economist. But you know what? 
And I would love you to go out of this room tonight and say, okay, they talked a lot out there, but I actually feel good because the minute I walk out of here, I don't feel like I have no power to do anything, I have no choice, and I have to believe all the stuff I read every morning in the newspaper about why things have to be the way they are. If you leave with that feeling tonight, then I think our discussion together would have been 100% worthwhile. Because my mission, and I believe, and I can only speak for myself here, and the United Nations is a vehicle for this discourse also, is about giving people hope that they can change the current state of affairs. And the political economy of land or of exploitation, of colonialism, and many of the other things that are here today, I am completely aware of them. But I don't want to sit back anymore and be defeated every time I go out. And Camilla, that's my answer to you. How do we change these things? By getting people out there to say, I don't want my country to be run by people who do not come from here and with their money have no interest. But that's the political process. We have to go out there and convince society that that is how we make changes in the political economy. But the fact that a green economy can function, I think, is something that you first now have to disprove by reading the Green Economy Report and 600 pages of it. <laughs> and once you've done that, then I'll accept every contradiction in terms of the practicality. The theory, I fully acknowledge, the green economy is not a mature societal model nor a fully developed understanding of what happens in our economy. But it is full of a lot of hope about getting up and doing something about it. Thank you. Yeah. That were good closing remarks already and it was uh, what I was planning to ask you all three as the last question that many of us that are in here believe in those ideas and have discussed things like that for quite a while but outside conferences like these the discussion is on a very different state and my question to this conference would be what has to be done to change it that not only the discussion gets out of these conference uh, places but that what we are discussing here becomes reality sometime. And I think this conference with a thousand people that are here to try to make things, to move things from discussions to reality, I would like to ask the two of you as well, I think you already answered the question, what you think would be the most important question that has to be discussed here and what should be the main message that people take out from this into these discussions during the next two days and into the world afterwards so that some of this that we have discussed here hasn't has to be discussed in 20 years again when we have a Rio plus 40 conference and still haven't moved on at all. Would you like to start, Tim? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the most, well, for me, the most important one is what does an economy look like when it isn't degrading resources it isn't transcending issues of climate, it isn't creating social injustice, it is employing people, giving them good health, good education, good work, decent work, and a sense of meaning and place in life. These, these are the fundamental questions, not what does it look like in terms of which technologies to invest in, not what does it look like in terms of what are the returns and the risk versus return reward structure of, a, of an in unequal financial sector, but what are the real mechanisms for giving people livelihoods within the constraints of a finite planet. And, and that, is, um, that is a question which should involve everyone. It should involve those who are concerned about ecology. It should involve those who are concerned about technology. It is a question which young economists come to me every day with a sense of enthusiasm about because they no longer have to sit in the lectures that they have been asked to accept for the years of their degree that there is no alternative from the existing system. There is an alternative and they want to build it. That is the job for today. Thank you. Camilla? It's, it's on? Okay. The first question we should be asking for us and uh, ourselves the next days is how to do not fall again in the false solution and how to avoid them, because we have developed a very, and as Nemo has said, a very keen sense to know, oh, here they are again, what's new? Because uh, over the time, kept maybe a very important trace of capitalism and how it's able to re-emerge and reinvent itself and actually 
eat <laughs> or grab all the solutions that we think and our good ideas and to present it, transform it and trans 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 transvest it. Uh, and I would say that, uh, again, know that capitalism was historically created and should be historically overcome. And in this sense, we don't need more political economy. We need political ecology and we need a radical different in the way we think and re-signified politics from a very and deep ecological sense. And this is not a task of economy. I'm sorry, this is... a more than anything, a matter of uh, uh, learning with history and uh, is an ethical commitment and it is an ethical compromise that we need to make. It's a point, it's a different point of view on how to see. The economy will follow. I think it's just the way of changing priorities. And Achim Stein, I wanted to add one sentence that he forgot in his closing remarks, which he did before I asked him. I feel very bad now because it sounds like I wanted to have the last word, but I, I wanted to just make one appeal to you as you meet in this Congress here over the next day and a half. This debate around the green economy is something that I think is absolutely legitimate. That's what we need to do when we interrogate these concepts, including the contradictions. However, I would urge you to think twice whether the enemy that you see in our political discourse today, also with Rio, we haven't talked very much about Rio, but in a few weeks' time, the world is meeting for something called Rio Plus 20. Barbara spoke about it. We are speechless. And if we go into Rio and, in a sense, shoot down as a part of the environmental community a concept that actually for many is at least encouraging and gives us new ideas on how to move forward. And we spend the entire energy on actually shooting within the camp, then I would be really sorry. Because I think we have a terrible moment in our history as human beings on this planet right now. And sometimes discourse is absolutely vital. And sometimes also we need to make alliances and we need to look and sometimes technology is not the enemy. Sometimes maybe even a private sector CEO is not the enemy. But when it is, then one should have that debate. But please look at Rio as not a completely lost summit because a lost Rio plus 20 also has a price. And that price is very high. And I think it is tragic that we are literally sliding towards a summit in a few weeks' time in which the world is speechless from the political leaders and also from those who could provide us with answers of why on earth, when we got it so right in 1992, are we where we are today? We owe ourselves more than that. And in that sense, I fully embrace the debate. But I would end with a little joke also because I was very intimidated when Barbara Unmusik sat in my office and said, well, Tim Jackson, haven't you met him yet? You know, this bestseller he has got. So, Tim, afterwards at the beer, I want to know the number of books you have sold, because when I heard this, I went to my office and I said, how many times has the UNEP Green Economy Report been downloaded? And this is the 650 pages, right? <laughs> Two million times. Never happened in the history of UNEP. That alone, I think, shows that it deserves the debate just as your commission reported, just as the critique does that came out of Porto Alegre. But I think it needs to be a, a, a discourse rather than there is a right and a wrong. There is a stupid and an intelligent. I think things deserve more interaction for the benefit of, yes, an imperfect social discourse. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, from my side, a big thank you to all the three of you on the podium. It, I think it was a very lively discussion, a discussion that was controversial, but found some, some common points, I think, and some points that we need to, to work on and some interesting questions for the, for the next days. So for me, it was a good discussion. I hope for all of you as well.